So today you should have read the Cyclops and I want to walk you through it and point out some of the important um, characteristics and traits from this episode of the Odyssey. So one of the laws of ancient Greek society um, was to honor strangers. And so we call that hospitality. So when Odysseus and his men find the Cyclops cave, they expect to be um, welcomed in. And basically they expect the 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 Cyclops to treat them with hospitality, which is quite the opposite. So we learn that here in the first stanza of this episode, um, where Homer tells us that Cyclops have no muster and no meeting, no consultation or old tribal ways, but each one dwells in his own mountain cave, dealing out rough justice to wife and child, indifferent to what the others do. So basically, Cyclops do what Cyclops want to do. It doesn't matter what the other Cyclop does. Um, they just individually do what they want. And so Odysseus and his men, they travel on um, and they see the mainland. They see the cavern yawning above the water. We have some really good personification in there. It's screen with laurel. There's rams and goats wandering around. Um, and Odysseus tells us that a prodigious man slept in this cave alone and took his flocks to graze a field. Um, and, you know, you kind of wonder, like, well, how did he know that beforehand? This is here to remind us that he's telling King Alcinous about his journey home. And so it's kind of like, hey, wake up. He is telling a story still. We're not completely in real time. So he tells us um, a prodigious man, which an enormous man lived there. Um, he was savage. And so Odysseus says that they beached their boat there, and they're going to go check out what's on the island. He took his 12 best, best fighters, and then he tells us about what he's going to take with him besides his fighters. He had seven shining golden talents and a solid silver wine bowl. We have a lot of S alliterations in there. And then he tells, about, tells us about this liquor. Um, he says it is pure and fiery. And later on, he calls it a wine, so it's kind of like a, a brandy wine kind of deal. Um, and he tells us about how special the wine is here. And he tells us that with this wine, we could take one cup of it and water it down with 20 cups of water, and it would still be very, very strong. So that is an intense wine. But he ends up taking this wine with them and some provisional items, such as food, and they go out to see what is in this cave. And they see all of these really good foods. They see lambs. They see kids. Remember, look at your footnotes here. Kids are young goats, not children, just to clarify. Um, then they see whey. That's going to be the thin, rot watery part of milk separated from thicker curds. So think like cottage cheese. And so they've been on this boat with each other. They're starving. Um, they're thirsty. And they just walk into this feast, basically. And so Odysseus's men have quite a good idea. They say, why not take these cheeses, get them stowed, come back, throw open all the pens and make a run for it. We'll drive the kids and lambs aboard. We say, put out again on good salt water. So basically they're like, hey, why don't we steal a bunch of stuff and hit the sea? And that's not a terrible idea considering how hungry they are and how desperate they are. Um, but here's what Odysseus says in response to that. He says, ah, how sound that was, yet I refused. I wished to see the caveman, what he had to offer. No pretty sight, it turned out, for my friends. So that's quite interesting because he says, oh, that was a good idea. But I said, no, I wanted to see what the caveman had to offer. So he was curious. And so he's a little bit selfish here. Because he does say, no pretty sight, it turned out for my friends. Again, you did not want to be friends with Odysseus because he did not have your best, best interest in mind. Because here his curiosity gets the best of him. Not really of him, but of his men. So he and his men, they stay. They light a fire. They see the Cyclops come in, toting a bunch of tree branches. Um, the Cyclops doesn't see them yet. And Odysseus and his men are scared because he's so big, they're hiding on the wall right here. And then he's milking his ewes and rams, the Cyclops is. And um, Odysseus sees him 
close the entrance to the cave with this big solid rock. And Odysseus says that two dozen four-wheeled wagons with heaving wagon teams could not have stirred the tonnage of that rock from where he wedged it over the door sill. So this means that there that Odysseus could have had 24 wagons try to pull that rock and it still wouldn't have moved. So Odysseus himself, even though he is an epic hero, probably cannot move this rock along with his men. So they're stuck. So the Cyclops rolls this rock over the entrance of the door and they're stuck in the cave. Then they're watching the Cyclops milk his crying ewes. Um, and he eats them, he eats and then he drinks some of the milk for supper. And then he's poking at his fire. And then they he sees Odysseus and his men as he's stoking the fire. And then he asks them, Who are you? Where are you from? How'd you get here? Odysseus is very confident in his answer here. He tells him that they're from Troy, they fought in the Trojan War, and they're on the way home, and that it is by their luck that they're standing in front of this monster, beholden for his help, asking for gifts, you know, he says, as custom is to honor strangers. So then again, there is our hospitality right there. Odysseus says, we would entreat you, great sir, have a care for the god's courtesy. Zeus will avenge the unoffending guests. So Odysseus says, you know what? If you don't show hospitality towards us, Zeus will avenge you. And of course, you have to think back to the beginning of this episode, what Homer tells us, that um, the Cyclops have no tribal ways, no traditions. They each do what they want to do. So they probably don't care what Zeus will do because, you know, again, they do what they want. And so the Cyclops said, calls Odysseus a ninny and tells him that he doesn't care about Zeus or any of the other gods because he's stronger than them. And uh, then he asks Odysseus, hey, where's your ship at? I wonder why he wants to know where his ship is. Well, he wants to destroy the ship and eat the men, basically. And here's a moment of epic hero intelligence when Odysseus says he sees through this and he does not tell the Cyclops where his ship is. He simply tells them that Poseidon destroyed his ship and his men, and the men that are left are the ones standing around him. Um, and so in the Cyclops, instead of showing the men hospitality, he eats them. Of course, isn't that what you would do? But anyways, um, he clutched at his companions and caught two in his hands like squirming puppies to beat their brain out spattering the floor, then he dismembered them and made his meal, gaping and crunching like a mountain lion. All right, so here's another Homeric epic simile because Homer is going to take something that we are familiar with and something we are unfamiliar with. So what might be familiar to hear is, as you know, you're seeing like a video or something of a mountain lion gaping or crunching. Like maybe you've seen that before, but you know what you haven't seen? A cyclops eating men. All right, so that's what he's comparing it to. He eats everything. He eats the innards, he eats the flesh, and he eats the men's bones. And so Odysseus and his men are completely appalled at this. Odysseus's um, adrenaline is pumping. He pulls his sword out to stab the Cyclops. And while he is about to stab the Cyclops, he realizes that if he does kill the Cyclops, he and his men are going to be stuck there because guess what? They can't move that big old doorway slab, so they have to kind of wait for morning. And then when the morning comes, um, the Cyclops, he builds his fire. He takes his ewes out to the pasture so they can eat, and then he closes the doorway slab. So Odysseus and his men thought that, that maybe they could run out, but they didn't because the Cyclops did close the door, the big rock slab, back over the door. So Odysseus, of course, prays to Athena and then he gets an idea. And here's his idea here. He sees a big olive tree in the corner. And so basically they hew it down to a big spear. And then he hides it in a dung pile, which is poop. Um, and he waits for the Cyclops to come back. So when the Cyclops does come back, he, um, he brings his flock in uh, along with the rams. And then he's milking them. And then Odysseus offers him some wine. What do you think he's going to do? Why, yes, you are right. 
he's going to take the wine and he is going to get the Cyclops drunk so he can stab him in the eye. So the Cyclops drinks the wine and he asks for more. Odysseus says um, that he gave him three more and he drank them. And then he tells the Cyclops when he asks him, Cyclops says, well, what is your name? And he says, you ask my honorable name? Remember the gift you promised me and I shall tell you my name is nobody, mother, father, and friends. Everyone calls me nobody. And so there are different translations of this. Um, the Greek translation is going to be um, spelt like this. That's why it's so funny looking. But other translations may say like no man or no one. Um, but in your textbook, it does say nobody. And then the Cyclops turns around and says, nobody's my meat then. After I eat his friends, others come first. There's a noble gift now. So he's like, Cyclops is pretty witty, actually. Um, and so he, Cyclops stumbles backwards. He basically passes out because he drank too much wine. And then Odysseus here, he's a really good leader when it comes to battle talk. Um, he says, now by the gods, I drove my big hand spike deep in the embers, charring it again and cheered my men along with battle talk to keep their courage up, no quitting now. And so this is an excellent epic, tri epic hero trait right here of leadership. Odysseus is going to be that one good teammate who can really pump up his team. Like, what time is it game time? Hoo, 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 hoo. He's pumping them up. Got to go stab this Cyclops in the eye. So he gets the spear, and he and his men, and they take it, and they ram it into his eye right here and just as you see it says so with our brand we bored that great eye socket while blood ran out around the red hot bar eyelid and lash were seared the pierce ball hissed brawling and the roots popped yum i hope you didn't just eat lunch because that is disgusting and here is another good epic homeric simile so right here homer is comparing something familiar again with something unfamiliar and so this is what an epic or Homeric simile is. Um, the familiar object here would be this a dies plunged and wrung in a cold tub. So that it would be like a, a wrought iron, like a cow prod, um, or like a cow branding iron that you get hot and then you brand the cow and then you take it and you stick it in a tub of cold water. Um, a bunch of cold and steam is gonna come up, right? It's gonna go So he's describing that for the Cyclops eye as it is being stabbed, which is definitely going to be unfamiliar because um, personally, I've never seen a Cyclops stab in the eye and I'm going to guess you have not either. Um, and so what happened? The Cyclops bellowed, the rock roared around him. He fell backwards. He's tugging the spike out of his eye. And then he runs over to the door. He starts trying to feel for Odysseus and his men because he just knows that Odysseus is trying to run away outside of his door and so then the cyclops he sticks his head out of his cave door and he calls for help to his other cyclop friends and he and they're like why are you screaming polyphemus by the way that's the cyclops name we're just told that for the first time here why do you scream polyphemus why do you cry so sore in the starry night and then polyphemus says oh nobody's tricked me nobody's ruined me See what Odysseus did there? See, nobody. All right. So because Polyphemus, the Cyclops here, is telling his friends that nobody has hurt him, they're like, oh, well, if nobody has hurt you, then why don't you just go back to bed and pray to your father Poseidon? And so, yes, it worked like a charm. And Odysseus tells us that he was filled with laughter because he deceived the Cyclops. Um, and then the Cyclops here, he... Um, takes the great door stone, and he's still trying to fail for Odysseus's men as they bolt. And Odysseus says, but I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there huge. How could we slip away? So Odysseus and his men still can't escape because the Cyclops is sitting there reaching for them as they're trying to run out the door. And so Odysseus gets this really good idea, which is another epic hero trait of intelligence. I'm sure Athena helped him come up with it. But he takes three of his rams and he ties them together 
And then he ties his men under each of the three rams. So they're hiding on the underbelly portion of the rams. And then Odysseus gets the choicest of the flock, the head ram, which are we surprised? No, because he is very arrogant. He has that hubris. Um, and they are to wait there until morning time. So that's also going to take superhuman strength for Odysseus to be able to hold on to the underside of these rams until the morning time. And so when the morning comes, um, the rams begin to stir because they need to go outside. And so the Cyclops, who is still blind and sick with pain from his head wound, he opens the stone on the door and he lets his rams out so they can go eat some grass and pasture. Um, and see, so here's an example of a picture of the Cyclops petting his head ram and Odysseus is clutching to the underside. Because remember, Odysseus didn't have to have three rams tied together because he had the head ram, and he's the biggest one. Um, <clears throat> but as they leave, um, the Cyclops is petting them, and he can't feel Odysseus and his men underneath them. And so here we have a moment of situational irony because um, the ram, I mean, the, the Cyclops is talking to his head ram, and he's like, oh, I wish you could tell me where that um, nobody is, oh, I would just take his head and I'd beat his brains out and they would just strew the floor. Um, and that's ironic because Odysseus is, in fact, hiding under the ram. Um, so then he gets out. Odysseus and his men get out. Odysseus unties all of his men. They roll to the left and right like ninjas trying to get on the boat. Then they take the rams with them on the boat and... Then um, here comes the Cyclops, um, and Odysseus just can't keep his mouth shut. This is when it all goes wrong. This is where his hubris, his excessive pride, is in full force. And so he says to the Cyclops here, O oh, Cyclops, would you feast on my companions? Puny am I in a caveman's hands. How do you like the beating that we gave you, you damned cannibal, eater of guests under your roof? Zeus and the gods have paid you. As in, like, you got served, Polyphemus. Like, take that. And, of course, this is going to anger the Cyclops. Odysseus just can't keep his mouth shut. But the Cyclops breaks off a piece of hilltop, throws it at Odysseus and his men, and barely misses the boat. But it does make a huge geyser of water um, and a huge spume and a big wave, and then it pushes Odysseus's boat back to the shore where they have to fend off with boat hooks and oars. And so Odysseus is mad again and he cups his hands to his mouth and as soon as he does to yell back at the Cyclops, his crewmates are like, no, Odysseus, don't do it. You saw what he did last time. Can you please keep your mouth shut? But of course, Odysseus says that he could not heed them in his glorying spirit there he is. He does admit that he did have a glorying spirit, his hubris. Um, and then this is where it just all goes wrong. He says, Cyclops, if ever mortal man inquire how you were put to shame and blinded, tell him, Odysseus, raider of cities, took your eye, Laertes' son, whose home's on Ithaca. Now, this is problematic because Odysseus was keeping his identity um, a secret which means the Cyclops couldn't curse him because I don't know if you recall, the Cyclops' friends yelling back at Polyphemus said, you can pray to Poseidon, your dad. Well, if Poseidon is the um, Cyclops' dad and the Poseidon's mad at Odysseus, this is just going to make things worse for him. So here, Odysseus is basically like, here's my name, my number, my address, my social security number, my credit card info, here is my Instagram handle, my Snapchat, my TikTok, my Twitter, whatever. He just lays it all out there for him. So now the Cyclops knows who he is. And then the Cyclops, Polyphemus here, tells us, Oh man, you know what? There was a prophet that lived here one time. He said that Odysseus would take my eye from me. And I never expected him to be this small, pitiful, and twiggy, but you, you, you conquered all my wits with wine and you blinded me. And so he is so mad. He says he's going to pray to the God of Earthquake, which is his father Poseidon. Um, 
And then Odysseus can't keep his mouth shut again. He tells him that he wants to hurl him down to hell. And, of course, that doesn't go well with the Cyclops. I mean, who wouldn't take that well? And so he lifts his hands up, the Cyclops does, and prays to his father Poseidon here to um, either kill Odysseus and his shipmates, or if it's destined for Odysseus to get home, then he needs to um, let it be far be that day that he sees his home and dark the years between, let him lose all companions, and return under strange sail to bitter days at home. Okay, so according to the invocation and what we already know about Odysseus's journey, yes, it takes him forever to get home and dark the years between. So yes, this first thing does come true. The second thing, it says, let him lose all companions. We do know that all of his shipmates are going to die. And then lastly, it says, return under strange sail to bitter days at home. So when you get home, things are going to be weird and not normal. Yes, that does happen too. So the question is, if Odysseus had kept his mouth shut, would he have made it home faster? And would his, ship, his shipmates made it home as well? Um, after Polyphemus cries to Poseidon in this, um, he hurls another stone at Odysseus and it misses the boat. And then Odysseus and his men, they make it away. And then later here, Odysseus talks about how they uh, take their boats to the shore and they eat some of the rams, and then Odysseus's ram, the choicest of the flock, the prize of all, should go to him, of course. But the kicker here is that Odysseus sacrifices this choicy prize ram to Zeus, but Zeus disdains it, meaning he does not accept it. And that is very problematic, meaning Zeus is very, very upset at Odysseus. So Odysseus is like, crap, I know bad things are about to happen. And so... Again, they wake up in the morning and they set off on their adventure, having their precious lives, but not their friends. Again, you don't want to be friends with Odysseus because several of them just got eaten by Cyclops. So just to recap here, um, <clears throat> why does Odysseus not kill the Cyclops when he's asleep? Well, he, if he does, he and his men will be stuck in the cave. Number three, what does Odysseus do to prepare for the Cyclops return to the cave? Um, he and his men use an olive tree that they find to make a weapon to attack the Cyclops. Um, again, what do Odysseus and his men do to Polyphemus? Well, they get him drunk, and then once he falls asleep, they stab him in the eye. And when the Cyclops um, wakes up in the morning, he tries to grab them with his hands. And so why don't the other Cyclops help Polyphemus? Well, Polyphemus says that nobody has tricked him, nobody has ruined him, so they leave him alone after that. What trick does Odysseus use to free his men and himself from the cave? Well, they tie together rams and they hide underneath them as they leave to go to their pastures for the day. And when, it is, when Odysseus is safely at sea, he boasts of his true identity. Um, what does Polyphemus ask Poseidon, the god of the sea, to do? Well, he asked him to do one of two things. First one is to kill Odysseus and his men. But the second thing is, well, if they do have to live, then why don't you let it be a long time for them to get home and dark the days between? Why don't you kill all of his shipmates? And then when he gets home, let things just be weird. Okay, so there's his prophecy. And then from this episode of the Cyclops, Odysseus has a lot of famous cleverness. And so several of those are going to be that it was intelligent for him to get Polyphemus drunk. Um, he attacked his eye because he only had one. Um, telling him his name was nobody. And lastly, the rams, tying the rams together and escaping so the Cyclops couldn't find him. So there are many, many traits in this episode of the Odyssey where Odysseus was very smart, but there was also a lot of hubris. In fact, it could have really changed the game for he and his men as the journey went on. Next, we will continue with the land of the dead.